If the Louvre had opened its doors on time, the French Revolution would not have occurred. This was the assessment of Jacques-Henri Maistre, a journalist and art critic, in the year 1795. Who knows if this museum, completed to perfection, he said, might not have saved the monarchy by providing a more imposing idea of its power and vision, by calming anxious spirits, and by dramatizing the benefits of the old regime. Such was the power that museums were thought to confer upon everyone associated with their creation. The politicians who commissioned them, the tycoons who paid for them, and the scholars who supplied them. We cannot understand who the historical Indiana Jones was unless we understand his relationship to the museum. More than anything else, the museum is the yardstick by which those who collect art and antiquities are judged to be good or evil. The man who keeps such treasures in his own possession is deemed a villain. Again, we see there is nothing you can possess which I cannot take away. By contrast, however, the man who gives his acquisitions to a museum is viewed as a selfless hero. I crossed an important artifact that belongs in a museum. In episode one, we learn that this process of exchange often serves as a form of money laundering for wealthy men and women who are looking to improve their public image. At the same time, it also provides a convenient pretext by which the archaeologist in the field can claim the moral high ground over any potential rivals, both the freelance art dealers who cater to private clients, as well as destitute peasants in search of a quick profit. They are greedy treasure seekers interested only in making a quick buck, but I am a scholar who labors on behalf of humanity, donating my time, labor, and money to a public institution devoted to science, education, and preservation. So when and how did the museum first come to serve this function? For the answer, we must travel to Paris. The year is 1750, the exact same year that Carl Weber took over the excavations at Pompeii and attempted to transform the site from the personal antiquarian quarry of King Charles into an outdoor museum open to the general public. A similar change occurred in France, and at precisely the same time. The analog to the private underground warehouse of Pompeii was the Wunderkammer, or Cabinet of Curiosities. Before the museum, the Wunderkammer served as the primary means by which European elites displayed their aesthetic riches before friends, colleagues, and anyone else they wished to impress. To enter a Cabinet of Curiosity was to enter a dense and claustrophobic assortment of optical delights. Some highlighted works of art, some focused on natural specimens, and a few did both. But none were open to the public, and all were motivated by the common desire to visually overwhelm their visitors with the vague but definite impression that the owner of such a room must be a great and scientifically learned man. In the year 1750, Louis XV, the King of France, decided to take this message of private grandeur and transfer it to a more public arena. The result was the Luxembourg Gallery, which might be seen as a halfway point between the Cabinet of Curiosities and the Louvre. For the next 30 years, the Luxembourg Gallery would do to the world of art what scientists were doing to the world of nature. In other words, it was the first institution to impose what was imagined to be an objective classification scheme upon a seemingly chaotic assortment of subjective matter. For the first time, Works of art were arranged as collective representatives of particular methodological schools. The Wunderkammer had provided a seductively emotional experience to an exclusive audience. Emphasis on visual spectacle had tended to blunt the prospect of open and critical analysis. By contrast, the Luxembourg Gallery would reverse these priorities and privilege education over spectacle. In other words, it would invite its visitors to learn. Learn about what? In short, how the creation and appreciation of art had contributed to the progress of mankind, not how it contributed to the reputation of one man. In order to do this, the laws of science were called into service. Much in the same way that the natural scientist drew up complex charts showing the relationship among species, genus, and family, the Luxembourg Gallery arranged its paintings in such a way as to demonstrate the lessons of time, place, and methodology of art. Jean-Baptiste Pierre Lebrun, a prominent art dealer and connoisseur, said that, quote, 
A collection not arranged in that fashion was as ridiculous as a natural history cabinet arranged without regard to genus, class, or family. For those who found the new scheme a little too abstract, the gallery was good enough to supply them with a mathematical scorecard. Here one could plainly see that, while Michelangelo was seriously deficient in his use of color, earning only four out of twenty possible points, he was a master of design with a mark of seventeen. Those who wanted to see artistic mastery on every front were best served by the paintings of Peter Paul Rubens, whose cumulative score of 65 topped all artists in the gallery. In 1779, the Luxembourg Gallery closed its doors to make room for the Comte de Provence, who received it as a gift from his older brother, Louis XVI. The king immediately commissioned new plans for an even more spectacular venue. Selected for this honor was the Louvre, which until then had housed 127 scale models of fortified towns and harbors across France, convenient for strategic war councils. Now it was to become the greatest and most accessible collection of instructive art ever seen. The Luxembourg Gallery had only admitted aspiring French artists. The Louvre, however, would happily admit every French subject free of charge, something that the British Museum, its ideological cousin and chronological rival, would not do for another 70 years, and even then with great reluctance. So what was in it for King Louis? Not the vague delusions of grandeur associated with the Wunderkammer. No, Louis XVI hoped for a far more ambitious return on this investment, for he wanted to be regarded not only as an enlightened patron of the arts, but rather a specific scientific arrangement of art, one that claimed to educate and improve the moral fiber of his subjects. Unfortunately for the king, the revolutionaries beat Louis to the finish line. The Louvre did not open its doors until seven months after the king had lost his head. When it did, on August 10, 1793, its eagerly sought associations with liberty, science, preservation, and modernity redounded to the revolutionaries, not to the monarchy. Yet scarcely had the insurgents began to bask in the glow of the Louvre before an even more powerful figure overtook them in turn. With the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte, the Louvre would undergo another momentous transformation. Not content to claim merely the mantle of scientific modernity for the French nation alone, Napoleon would use the Louvre to display art and antiquities taken from all the lands and peoples to come under the dominion of the expanding French Empire. Instead of a royalist Louvre or a revolutionary Louvre, France would now have an imperialist Louvre. Throughout Europe, Napoleon's agents drew up a list of the most coveted works of art stored within the palaces and castles of every single duke, prince, and king who surrendered to his armies. From Venice, Napoleon removed the four bronze horses of St. Mark from atop the basilica and had them installed on the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel in Paris. From Bruges, the French army took Michelangelo's Madonna and Child. With Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo in 1815, both were returned to their original owners, along with approximately half of the several thousands of paintings, antiquities, and rare manuscripts that were looted from every region of Europe except the British Isles. While in France, their stewardship had been explained as the, quote, liberation of the fruits of genius from the gaze of servitude to the land of liberty and equality. In 1798, a song was written to celebrate the arrival of a convoy of artwork from Belgium. Its lyrics declared that, quote, Rome is no more in Rome. Every hero, every great man, has changed country. Rome is no more in Rome. It is all in Paris. But it wasn't just Rome that was imagined to be in Paris. In the summer of 1798, flush with the success of his continental campaigns, Napoleon landed a French fleet on the northern coast of Egypt and occupied the city of Cairo. The glories of ancient Egypt were then packed up and shipped to France. Now, the Louvre and its nearby grounds were home not only to the original collection of Louis XVI, but also to the Roman horses of St. Mark, the marble sculptures of the Italian Renaissance, old master paintings of the Low Countries, and the obelisks of the pharaohs. Faced with such a magnificent display in Paris, 
Who else in Europe could possibly mount a rival claim to the mantles of science, education, and preservation? For the answer, we must leave the European mainland and join the British Navy as it ventures into the lands of the Sultan. For it was in Athens, Cairo, and Constantinople that the ideals of the modern museum would be invoked outside of the borders of Europe for the very first time. And it was in the Ottoman Empire that the historical Indiana Jones encountered his first test among a culturally alien people. Please join us next time as we explore the history of the Elgin Marbles in Episode 4 of Indiana Jones in History. <laughs>